titled this A Confusing Life Before Christ. Um, and I think you'll understand as I explain, my mother and my grandmother would take me to church, to a Baptist church up in Leicester where I was born as a young girl. And I always thought of myself as a Christian. You know, I thought parents are Christian. Um, I must be born a Christian. Um, I'd always believed in God and the Bible. My mother would pray with me by my bedside um, every night. And uh, I would always remember praying for all my family. Um, and I just, you know, I thought I knew the God of the Bible, even though I had not read the Bible. And I knew Jesus was born in a stable and the Christmas story and that he died on the cross. But I certainly now realize I did not fully know the Jesus of the Bible as I am continuing to get to know him now. My father's mother, she was an Irish Catholic, um, but my father never really came to church with us ever. So um, I take you back um, to a time um, between 1961 and 1973. Now, that time, when I grew up in primary school and secondary school, we had every day an assembly before class, and we, it was a religious assembly. We would sing hymns and we would pray, and then we'd go to our classroom. And that would happen all through the term for both primary school and secondary school. So I remember a lot of my hymns, and I can sing some of them off by heart even now. Um, so then I um, was 16. And this was a time in my life where we as teenagers um, just aren't sure what life's all about. So um, it was 1972. So... Um, so Half a century ago, that was. I was watching a film on the television with my mother. Uh, she enjoyed the Hollywood movies, and it was a film called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, which was made in 1967. Not many people probably will know that movie, but um, I said to my mother after I was watching it, I'd love to marry a man like Sidney Poitier. To which my mother surprised me with her reply, knowing she's a Christian and goes to church, and she said to me, I don't wish to offend anybody, but it was the language of the day when my mother was alive in the 70s. Um, my mother surprised me and said, um, I don't want any half-caste grandchildren. Now, I loved and respected my mother, but when she said that, I had wanted to say to her, but mummy, you're a Christian, and God tells us we should love everybody. But I just kept quiet. So then we move on five years, and I'm coming down to London in 1977 to do a medical secretarial course. And I stayed in a hostel, and this is where I met my husband, who had just arrived recently from Ethiopia. So we started dating, um, and in the summer of 1977, my Ethiopian boyfriend asked me to marry him. But first he said he needed to ask my father for my hand in marriage. During the time I was dating my husband, I had told him much about my family and my mother's views about what people refer to as mixed race couples. And despite all that, my boyfriend still wanted to marry me and I him. So I wrote a letter to my parents. Um, they had no idea that I'd been dating someone for the last two years. Um, their friends all would tell each other about their children and who they were going out with, but I'd kept it quiet for a reason. Um, and in this letter, I said I'd understand if they never wanted to see me again after they'd read my letter. And I told them my boyfriend was from Ethiopia and he wanted to come and ask my father for my hand in marriage. Um, so I went home um, on my own first, and I expected my parents to probably say, thank you, it was nice to see you, but you can leave now, go and live your life. Um, but that didn't actually happen. Um, my father's response was, you've made up your mind, obviously, so bring the young man home, we'd like to meet him. But my mother actually, sadly, never said a thing, she always kept quiet. Um, so then the weekend came, um, two weeks later, my husband-to-be and I came home to Leicester, and um, my father went into the lounge with him, and I was in the kitchen with my mother, and she said nothing to me. And my father came through and he said, um, Jane, 
um, very nice young man. Um, he's asked for your hand in marriage. I believe you wanted me to say yes. And I said, yes, Daddy, I did. So in 1981, we were married in London. Um, two things, sadly, on the eve of my wedding. And again, it was hard, this. Uh, my brother, I phoned to ask if he was coming to the wedding. And he then said to me, um, no, um, I'm not. And you don't really need to marry him. You could live with him instead. This really upset me. I couldn't understand this Christian family I'd grown up in. And then um, my mother's brother, at the meal before the, the day before the wedding, he turned to me, my uncle, and said, why am I turning from my own kind? So I just kept, you know, politely quiet, um, but I, you know, was very respectful of these older people. But I knew my heart. So we had um, six relatives at the wedding, two of my friends and my husband's best man. So a very small wedding. And the registry offices in those days actually did refer to God in their wedding vows. So it was a beautiful um, ceremony, I found, with what we had to say to each other. So then life started as a married couple. And my husband and I, we'd always wanted four children. Again, I'm not sure why. <laughs> I'm one of three two older brothers, and we had two girls, in nine, one in 87 and one in 1988, and then we had two boys, uh, one in 1991 and one in 1997. And we gave them names from the Bible, Rachel, Hannah, Zacharias, and Jeremiah, because for me and my husband, a child is a real miracle from God, and uh, just wanted to say thank you to the Lord by giving them some names which have a lot of meaning, as do everybody's names, I know that. So, um, in 1987, after I, um, I'd had, just before I had my second uh, child, my husband was diagnosed with high blood pressure and put on medication. And then, um, between 1987 and 1991, my husband and I were both working full-time, and our two young girls were in nursery full-time. And... Um, it was pretty exhausting doing that, but that's what we did in those days to bring things together. Then in 1991, in the November, my third child was born. Um, and my husband and I realized that childcare was very expensive and you don't get buy one, get one free. Um, and we, he said, if we can manage one of us staying at home, that is the ultimate way to raise family, have one at home. And uh, he suggested that he would stay at home and asked if I minded continuing in full-time work because I, at the time, was earning slightly more than him in his salary. Um, and I was happy to do that. So I um, continued in my work, at which time I was actually um, working in a GP surgery as a manager. And then in 1997, June, we had our fourth child, another son. Um, I just want to take you um, to a time after uh, we had, uh, well, before we had the children, um, remembering my mother, um, because my mother and my husband became the best of friends, and this was an amazing walk and journey, because I'd loved my parents very much, even though when I was a teenager I thought they were old-fashioned. That's another thing my generation would often refer to our parents, we're old-fashioned, they're old-fashioned, you've got to move with the time, you know, you don't have to get married these days and all this. Um, and like, um, you know, we would just say, you've got to just change. Um, after my husband and I got married, we would go regularly, weekends, any holidays we had, we'd go up to my parents in Leicester for holidays, weekends, where we spent summer holidays down in Devon, staying with my parents, and my parents got to know my husband more and more. And then, um, sadly, my mother had a blood disorder, so she'd had that from the time I was 18 years old, but she never complained and was still attending church. Then, um, every time my husband and I would go to Leicester to stay, even when we had the children, I would actually be so tired I'd go to bed and my husband would spend many hours talking with my mother in the evening, so they really did get to know each other. And they, you know, we would spend Christmas with them and my mother would make toys for the children. So, you know, 
I couldn't quite understand what was going on in my life at this point, but it was good. It was happy. Um, so then... Um, most evenings, my husband and my mother would stay up late chatting. My mother was always interested about other parts of the world, and she loved reading books and autobiographies and things. So, you know, she'd get a, she actually ordered a book about Ethiopia, so she'd get to know more about it. So these 11 years um, before my mother passed away in 1993 were very special times, seeing my husband and my mother getting to know each other. But sadly, in 1993, my mother passed away. And um, my husband said to me, your mother was like the mother I never had. And what had happened is, um, his mother, he never knew. She was taken away from his father by her brothers because apparently my, father's, my husband's father was not good enough for her. And um, he found his father crying one day when he was seven years old, and he asked him, he said, Daddy, why are you crying? And he said, your mother's died. And he said, and my husband said to him, but she's in the kitchen. And he said, his father said, that's not your mother. So, you know, my husband always said, our children will always know both their parents. So um, I add this next bit because it's quite significant because I don't quite understand why it happened. But when my mother passed away in 1993, we had three children, and um, I had a strange experience. I was now back at work. I'd had some, um, some bereavement leave, but I experienced some unsettled thoughts in my mind, which I told my husband. I didn't feel depressed or anything, but as I would go to the tube station each morning to go to work, it was like a voice saying inside of me, you're worthless. Um, and when I would walk to the, towards the tube station, the voice would say, all you need to do is just step out in front of that double-decker bus or that lorry. Now, I felt like I had something all over my body stuck to me. It just wouldn't wash off. And then the other thing I had was that while I was in the house at home, again, the voice would say, you're worthless. You're not needed in this home. Just walk out the front door and leave and never come back. So I told my husband um, all these thoughts that were coming in, and he said... Um, he said he didn't know what more he could do to help and thought I'd to see the GP. I did actually go and see the GP, but before I did, I wrote down a list of all the things I'd been going through up to the period of my mother passing away. My older brother had been going through a separation from his wife, and I was trying to help mend things and think I could sort all their lives out and make it better. But um, it was a strange thing because... I always say to people, if you, if you have a problem, write them down on paper. Because I took it to the GP and I put it in front of him and I said, I told him exactly what I just told you. And he said, you're going through bereavement, he said. I could give you antidepressants, but I won't because you're sleeping fine. Um, but this list you've given me, you cannot do all this and you're not going to be able to. But the strangest thing was, after that appointment, when I got home, I never experienced those thoughts again. So I still don't quite understand what that was about. So we now move into 1998, after the birth of our fourth child. Um, in uh, August of 1998, um, my husband's routine blood tests for his high blood pressure had come back showing some concerns, the doctor said, um, that his kidneys were beginning to fail and no longer functioning well enough. So he would need to start to have daily and nighttime home dialysis um, a machine at home, which would continue until a kidney could become available for transplant. So our family can life continued, just doing the things that families do and go on holiday. Even though my husband had a dialysis, dialysis machine, it was amazing. We were able to go abroad with it, and they would make sure all the fluid was over there. And um, my husband was, you know, managed this for a good eight years. Um, and so he was doing really well. We were just continually waiting for a kidney to come through that would eventually help him bet more. So now we move on to um, 2005. Um, our firstborn daughter went to university in Derby. 
um, and this was the October, so it was a whole family event. Everyone into the car, we're taking the firstborn to university, going to leave her there in her digs, and all will be well. <laughs> um, so that was all exciting, and um, she came home that Christmas in October, uh, December 2005. We had a lovely Christmas time together. And then um, in January, she went back to university. Um, and after she had left and gone back to university, um, one evening, my husband came to me and he said, I don't feel well, one Sunday in the up night. So um, I had to drive him down to the Royal London Hospital. Um, and they found he had an infection and they kept him in and put him on antibiotics. Sadly, my husband was never to return home and died five months later in June 2006 after a major heart valve operation and various other interventions to try and help find out what was causing his problem. Um, I sat with my husband and held his hand as he slipped away from this world and all the trauma he'd gone through the past five months. I was still in the hospital in the waiting room when my eldest daughter rang me to ask how her father was. I asked her if she was with friends and she said no. I just knew at this point I could not lie and I had to tell her the truth and so I told her her father had just died. It was one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. It's not something you like to do over the phone. The second was arriving home to our three other children and to sit with them and tell them that their father had died. So now I have four children. They're now 19, 18, 15 and 9 when their father died. Now two things puzzled me when my husband died. Um, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit of an emotional person, as you could probably hear in my voice just then. Um, but uh, I can watch a movie and I'll cry. But I never cried when my husband died. And I didn't cry at the funeral. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't sad. I was sad in a way. But I just didn't understand. Um, and I wasn't angry. You often see in the movies people shaking their fists at God and saying, you know, you know, I hate you because you've taken our loved one away. But I wasn't angry either. So this was all puzzling to me. So obviously we, we had the funeral. And uh, we just, just tried to get on the best way we could, all of us. There was no book you could pick up to say where you go and how you handle things next. Just want to take you back a little bit about when my husband was alive, he and I had been looking for a church to attend. In fact, while he was in hospital, and this struck me, he said to me one evening, when I get out of hospital, I'm going to church to thank God. And secondly, I'm going to ask my brother back in Ethiopia if he'll give me one of his kidneys. Neither of us knew, sadly at that time, that my husband's younger brother had already passed away. He'd been in the army and got killed. My husband had been raised in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and he would tell me that as a child, before they could start school, um, they would have to read the Bible in their language. Um, so, you know, his father raised him to be a, a good, good, good child and a good young man. So we had had our four children christened in the Church of England as babies, but we still couldn't find a church that we were comfortable felt at home in. Our family life, we were all doing the best we could. So now, 2007, a year after my husband had passed away, my eldest daughter in September 2007, she was at university in Derby, telephoned me and said to me, she had given her life to Jesus. What did this statement my daughter had made mean, I asked myself. I was soon to find out and I was going to be taken on the most amazing and wonderful journey of a lifetime. Mm. About two weeks after my eldest daughter, Rachel, had told me she'd given her life to Jesus Christ, she was due home for the weekend. I think she'd also contacted her siblings because her sister and her 15-year-old brother came to me and said, Mummy, you need to get Rachel away from what she's caught up in. 
It could be, you know, a cult or something. I replied to them, I know one thing, God does not break up families, but I don't understand what she's found. That weekend, my daughter was coming home. I said to God, if Rachel is caught up in bad company, please reveal it to me in some way. I have to say, I don't normally ask God for things on a regular basis, so this was quite unusual for me. That weekend, my daughter, Rachel, arrived home. She was still my beautiful daughter. She sat down on the sofa and talked to me about some of the scriptures in the Bible, like I'd never heard them explained, even when I'd studied them at school. Back in the days I was at primary school and in our scripture lessons, I'd never heard them explained and talked about like she spoke about them. Now, at this point, my pride got the better of me and it started to creep up inside me as I was thinking about what she was telling me. And she then said this statement to me, no one, mummy, is going to take Jesus away from me. To which I, with my pride and me thinking, I'm the parent, I know more than my children, foolish I am, I said back to her, Rachel, I'll never join your church. I have God here with me. And I pointed and did that to her. My daughter told me the name of her church, Potter's House in Derby. One other thing I'd like to just mention when she told me she'd given her life at an altar call. Um, she had told me a friend had invited her to Potter's House Church in Derby. And she said the pastor had preached a sermon about her life. I then said being foolish again. Oh, your friend knows what's you know, happened in your life and told the pastor he's bringing you to church. So the pastor's written a sermon around your life and recent issues. <coughs> That's how I used to think vicars back in the day when I was a child. I thought they looked in the newspapers and wrote sermons like that. So from this point on, I set about researching the potter's house online to try and understand better what my daughter had found. This research would take me up to Derby to see my daughter and go with her to church. She would also frequently come down to London and go to the potter's house church in Folkestone Road building to hear one of the visiting pastors preaching. One time she came down and I said, could I meet at one of these services? And she said, oh yes, mommy, come along, come along. I'll never forget the first time I walked into the Folkestone Road Church building and seeing so many people from all walks of life and all ages. At least there was possibly 250 people there, if not more. And I said to myself, where have I been? How have I missed all this? And I realized I was lost. Now I know. Pastor Tom Payne had come to preach the time I went to visit uh, the Walthamstow um, Folkestone Road Church. And I'll never forget that service. I heard people speaking in tongues. I saw people responding to the altar call. And everyone was so friendly and welcoming. I thought, this is like a big family. They all seemed to be so kind and friendly. I had a conversation with Rachel about what people said about her church and she explained that we are all born sinners and we do not want to obey God. We all want to do our own thing and live it up in the world and all the world has to offer. I thought about that. When she said we were born sinners, I got a bit of a revelation because I thought that's true. All my children, I didn't have to teach them how to be naughty. They're naturally like that. I had to teach them how to be good. Wow, that was an amazing revelation to me. So between 2000, September 2007 and April 2009, I had been doing my research and meeting up with my daughter when she would visit in Walthamstow and I would visit her in Derby and she would come down on impact teams. Then one Sunday morning, in April 2009, my second daughter, Hannah, who was now at University 2, was home for the weekend. 
and I noticed she was up early and was dressed smartly. So I asked her where she was off to, and she said, church. This was one of my children who back in September 2007 had said her concerns about her sister possibly being caught up in the wrong company. Immediately, and without any hesitation or further questions, I said to her, can I come with you? And she said very enthusiastically, yes, come on along. So I got my youngest son, Jeremiah, now 11, and said, we're going to church. So the three of us went off to the Potter's House Church. As I continued attending the church on a regular basis, everything I was hearing about my daughter's church that they were now both part of just followed the scriptures in the Bible. And I'd like to share some of those scriptures. There was one particular scripture which um, my daughter first explained talk to me about and I'd never heard it in the Bible. It had never been brought to my attention. And it's the story of Nicodemus. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then... It made so much sense now of being born again. And um, another scripture that struck me with what my daughter's church would do is Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so people go out on impact teams, on outreach to share the gospel with as many people who don't know about Jesus. Then one of my favourite, favourite scriptures, and it touched me before I got saved, is Psalms 51, 10 to 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your generous spirit. And on Sunday, the 21st of June, 2009, I gave my life to Christ, and it has been the best decision I have ever made in my life. And I encourage anybody here who hasn't yet done that, it's worth it. Thank you for your time. <laughs>